might drop in as we start. I'm going to hand over to uh, Sarah Barker, who's going to lead us through today's session, along with Emma and Jacqueline, um, uh, about the Macmillan Innovation Showcase Challenge. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Vanessa, um, and uh, good morning and welcome everybody um, to this uh, Macmillan Innovation Showcase event, uh, which is being delivered by the Health Innovation Network um, and by Macmillan Cancer Support. Um, so can I just check that slides all look OK? Yes, yeah, I can see Perfect. Yes. OK. Um, great, I will um, carry on then. So I am going to kick off by talking a little bit about um, the Health Innovation Networks um, and their involvement in the Macmillan Innovation Challenge. Um, so my name is Sarah Barker um, and I'm an Innovation Manager at Health Innovation Kent, Surrey, Sussex, and I manage the programme of Cancer Innovations there. So the Health Innovation Network is um, actually a network of 15 health innovation networks, um, which cover the whole of England, as you can see from the map there. Um, and our aim is to tackle national problems in locally tailored ways. Um, and we do that in partnership with local systems so that everybody benefits from innovations. We were created in 2013 um, and then we were called the Academic Health Science Network, uh, which was a bit of a mouthful, shortened to AHSN, which um, some of you may be familiar with. Um, we are commissioned by NHS England um, and the Office for Life Sciences to deliver the spread and adoption of healthcare innovation. And we were renamed um, the Health Innovation Network in October last year, um, and that was really um, just to just to try to describe a bit better what it is that we do. Um, so our purpose um, is to transform lives through innovation. Um, and we work with healthcare organisations and businesses to support the spread of all types of innovation within the NHS, from new technologies to new ways of working and service improvements. And we do this with the aim of achieving these three things that you can see here to improve services for patients, uh, to enable NHS efficiencies and save money um, and to support economic growth in the communities that we work in. So who do we support? Um, first and foremost, we support patients. So we aim to help patients to access proven innovations through real world evaluations, including supporting things like nice development of new guidelines. Um, and we are uh, we work very hard to co-produce and co-design programmes that ensure that the public voice is heard. Uh, so when we work with innovators, we um, we encourage them very much to um, ensure that patients are involved in the work that they do. Uh, we work with our NHS regions and systems to really uh, try to understand what the problems are and what their needs are and, and help um, them to articulate those needs in a, in a way that is, um, that, that is understandable to innovators um, and supports them. Um, so we um, develop local, implement, sorry, local innovation plans with ICSs. Um, to adopt sp and spread proven innovations and these and we also help to match innovations to address those unmet needs that we've helped to um, identify. Um, we support innovators, um, so that's banks up in the middle of this slide and, and that's my role mainly is to support innovators um, who have new innovations that, that will help patients with cancer. Um, so we help innovators to develop commercial skills, um, apply for funding and to further develop their innovations. Um, and then we introduce innovators to um, the key players in the system and also to experts who will help them um, and, 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 and we help them to navigate the, the sort of complex nature of, of the health and care systems, because if you don't know the health and care systems well, it's very difficult to find the right person to speak to, the right committee to present your innovation to. And because we all have um, NHS backgrounds and, um, and, and experience, we're able to help with that. Um, so we work with NHS providers, uh, particularly we work with clinicians and teams to help redesign clinical pathways um, to support the implementation of innovations. And we provide training to help 
um, staff build their knowledge, capacity and um, capability to manage new innovations, approaches um, and equipment. Um, sorry, something just fell off my desk. Um, we also support um, UK PLC. Um, so we support um, the organisations that, that, that we uh, work with to leverage funding to create and safeguard jobs in, in the UK. Um, and through our um, partnership with the Department of International Trade, we also help um, export UK companies and, um, um, and also to bring new innovations in to the UK. So as well as all of these, um, as well as all of these organisations, we also um, support the third sector and charities. And so we were delighted to be approached by Macmillan to support this challenge, which was focused on virtual care. Um, so there were three health innovation networks involved in this challenge that you can see at the bottom there. So there's Health Innovation East, Health Innovation Kent, sorry, Suffolk, uh, and uh, Health Innovation Yorkshire and Humber, and I think they are all represented on the call. Um, between us, we provided um, a Macmillan with a comprehensive horizon scan of innovations that we thought might meet their challenge brief. So just um, the aims for today. So um, the aims for this showcase are to share and highlight the six shortlisted innovations um, with the wider cancer com community yourselves, um, including our cancer alliances, um, to support the spread and adoption of these innovations uh, where that's appropriate, with the ultimate aim of improving patient outcomes and experience. So before I hand over to Emma from Macmillan, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the six finalists um, from the challenge. Um, and then Emma will talk through um, the Macmillan's in, 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 the history of the Macmillan Innovation Challenge and introduce our um, person with lived experience who's um, been a partner on this project. So the finalists. Um, so there were six finalists. There's only five logos here, all will become clear in a moment. Um, so the first finalist um, is Definition Health. Um, so Definition Health's Virtual Cancer Ward um, is a platform that supports people with cancer from their first clinic visit um, through to virtual ward follow-up. Um, Doppler um, is a virtual ward platform designed to facilitate remote patient monitoring and communication between uh, people with cancer and their healthcare professionals. Um, we have Bibris, which is a virtual care platform uh, powered by artificial intelligence, uh, and it's designed to support community and family care workers in conducting clinical health assessments of people with cancer at home. Uh, we have Vine Health, uh, so the Vine Health Oncology platform um, is designed to help empower people with cancer to improve their quality of life through supported self-management. And finally, we have Humor, who had two uh, products that were finalists, which is why there are five logos, but six finalists. Um, so Humor DBM Health um, is a mobile communication system designed to support people who need their blood glucose level monitored remotely. Um, and then the other humour product is their SACT digital health um, checklist. Um, so this, um, this is a systemic anti-cancer therapy technology platform designed to allow clinicians to monitor the health of people with cancer remotely so they can pre-assess their readiness for treatment before they attend the clinic. Um, so those were our six finalists. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Emma, um, who's going to take us through the next section of um, this presentation. Thanks, Sarah. I'm not sure if you wanted to maybe stop sharing slides. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name's Emma Quintel. I'm one of the senior innovation managers here at Macmillan uh, Cancer Support. My role involves identifying innov innovations and solutions um, that will address some of the biggest challenges facing people living with cancer currently, and then supporting the implementation scale up of those solutions across our cancer support operations. So last year, as Sarah mentioned, we partnered with three health innovation networks, Health Innovation East, Kent Surrey Sussex and Yorks and Humber, to deliver our first ever innovation challenge. And we were looking to find the next big innovation within virtual care that could have the potential to really transform the lives of people living with cancer. 
And by virtual care, we mean that we were looking for solutions that could deliver uh, care, treatment and remote monitoring for people with cancer outside of the hospital, either at home or in their local community. The, during the pandemic, we saw more and more people receiving support virtually, virtual wards, have continued to be rolled out across the country and early evidence and feedback from, from patients, but also clinicians has been positive. We know that virtual care has the potential to deliver high quality service to people li with living, uh, living with cancer that makes their experience just more convenient, more streamlined and more closely aligned to their needs, which was why we were really keen to focus our first challenge in this area. So last year, with the help of the three HINs, we selected 35 innovators and we invited mm -hmm. them to submit an expression of interest to take part in the challenge. Rather than put out an open call for innovations, we decided to start small and, and really test this approach. So this, this was a really new way for us uh, to work at Macmillan. So the HINs ran comprehensive horizon scans and they identified innovators yeah, that, who were already, apologies, can if can people mute themselves i can just hear someone speaking in the background if you're not speaking can you mute yourselves on the call thank you so rather than put out a, 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 an open call for innovations we decided to, to start small the hins ran the horizon scans for us and they identified innovators who already had uh, relevant solutions in virtual care and this included innovations that had been either developed specifically to support people living with cancer, but also others that had been used successfully to support people with other conditions that had the potential to be adapted to support people with cancer in the future. In terms of Macmillan's offer to the winners of the challenge or winner of the challenge in this case, our support to the innovator could include things like opportunities to gather further evidence and support in finding test sites with the help of the HINs direct involvement of people living with cancer to support the testing of their innovation via our innovation community, which is a cohort of people living with cancer up and down the country that have a specific interest in, in innovation. And then finally, funding or financial support from Macmillan, so either through a grant or through equity investment. So of those 35, I think 15 submitted an expression of interest and six of those were shortlisted for the final pitch event. Uh, and as a result, Humor was selected as the overall winner of the Midman Innovation Challenge. Our uh, expert panel uh, included representatives with clinical, commercial and innovation expertise from, from both Macmillan and the Health Innovation Network, as well as people with lived experience from our innovation community. I'd, I'd like to take this opportunity to say a big thank you to the three HINs for their support bringing their knowledge, their expertise to the process and making it such a successful, but also a really enjoyable experience. And an even bigger thank you to the people uh, with lived experience on the panel that supported our decision-making process, but also really helps us to understand the impact that these innovations could have for people living with cancer. So we're now working with Human to develop the partnership approach and identify a test site and the Health Innovation Network teams continue to support not only the, the six finalists, but also other innovators across their locations. So whilst only one innovation was chosen as the winner of the challenge, it was felt that the other shortlisted companies demonstrated the potential for significant impact uh, for people living with cancer so, uh, and other conditions. So uh, the selected finalists from the challenge have been invited to this showcase event here today to enable them to demonstrate their progress today and share their innovations with a wider audience. But before we move on to the pitches, I'd like to introduce Jacqueline, one of our innovation community members, a person with lived experience of cancer. I think it's all too easy for us to sometimes get lost in our day-to-day -day business and us as, as usual and really overlook the impact that we're all making to the lives of people living with cancer. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jacqueline to tell us about her experiences of supporting the development of cancer innovations, but also the difference that they can have on the lives of people living with cancer. So uh, welcome Jacqueline and I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much, Emma. As Emma said, my name is Jacqueline. Good morning, everyone. I was diagnosed with lymphoma, which is a type of blood cancer in September, 2022. And I had the privilege of being diagnosed in a Macmillan Cancer Center. So my relationship with Macmillan developed very early on in my cancer journey. Um, I believe it was January 2023, I was still going through chemotherapy 
when I decided to join the cancer, the Macmillan Innovation Community. And the reason for me wanting to join that community is because I realized how difficult life is going through cancer. Um, and I wanted to be the change for the future as so many people had gone forward um, to put me in the position that I was in the care that I received in 2022, I wanted to make a huge impact in helping people find new ways of working and supporting Macmillan in that journey. Um, quickly on, I, I got involved and we had regular meetings and the first project, I remember it vividly, um, speaking with Lucy and the innovation team was for NutriCheck. And when she was pitching the project, I remember sitting there on the on the Zoom call and I was in tears because the night before I'd been in hospital for about six hours um, being checked for sepsis. And I wish I could say that was the first time that I'd gone and sat for hours in hospital to be checked for sepsis, but it was probably about the third or fourth occasion through my chemotherapy journey. So to understand that there, there was a device that you could have at home that you could check whether you had sepsis or not, for me just felt like a miracle. And I just, it kind of fueled my passion to really work with Macmillan to give them the insight um, in how to support people with um, cancer. And I'm just so thrilled to be part of this project and part of the community. Um, being involved in this year's project was absolutely exceptional as well. I always joke within the cancer community, every day outside of hospital is a good day. Um, as a cancer patient, you spend so much of your life in hospitals waiting, not doing necessarily an awful lot. Um, the NHS, as we all know, is in dire straits in terms of their time and capacity. So a lot of time is waiting around every day that you're in hospital is a day that you're not living your life to the fullest. You're not able to relax with your children, work, and just rest and recover. Because when you're in hospital, there's such anxiety as well. When you're sitting there waiting, you don't know what's gonna happen. Um, so when I got the pitch about Huma and the app, I just saw the endless possibilities that that could bring. Um, today's generation, everyone is on an app and using technology for different things. And to feel that you're in control of your care in a certain way that you can have access to information, have direct contact with your doctors without physically having to leave the house when you feel absolutely abysmal when you're going through treatment is definitely something that I was really excited to be involved in. And I'm really excited to see the rollout and how that is going to help benefit all those living with cancer now and in the future. And I wanted to take the opportunity to thank you all because as a cancer patient the journey feels very lonely at times and you feel that you're just going ahead and trying to see the light at the end of the tunnel and me sharing with other cancer patients the work that I'm doing and the work that all of these other incredible organizations are doing to try to make our lives a little bit easier day by day I'm, I know that this future of cancer care in 10 years is going to be substantially different to what it was when I was going through my treatment and I can't help but thank you enough for all of your support and continuous work in helping us all. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Thanks for sharing your experience. Uh, I think we'll all agree, very powerful um, and a good reminder of why we're all here and what, why we're doing what we're doing. Um, I think I'm handing back to Sarah at this point, or is it Vanessa? Yes, I'll, I'll take over. Thanks, Jacqueline. It's really humbling to hear somebody's story. Um, and, you know, it's really important that we reflect on what we do and uh, just, you know, the, the reasons for doing it. You know, we we love our jobs and we love seeing the innovations come through um, and, and we like to make a difference. So to hear that, you know, we do make a difference is marvellous. Thank you so much for that. Um, we're going to hand over to our first innovator. Karen Jett, are you on? Karen Jett from yes. Huma. Hi, thank you for joining us and congratulations because you are the, the winner. So you're going first. Um, you're sharing your slides. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you with it. Um, if anybody wants to post questions in the chat, if you feel more comfortable doing that, we will be checking the chat. Richard's going to put a uh, feedback link into the chat so that if you want to connect with any of our innovators today, we will put you in touch. 
Um, and also after afterwards, if you've got any questions, if you want to raise your hand and we will give you an opportunity to question the innovators as well. Thanks, Karen. Jet, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Vanessa. And thanks, everyone, for um, sort of the introductions. Jacqueline, it is super humbling to hear your experience and it really does make you reflect on the importance of the innovations that we're working on. So uh, lovely to meet you all. My name is Karanjeet Orjula. Um, I'm Vice President of Partnerships at Huma. Um, and we are thrilled to win um, Macmillan's Innovation Challenge last year. Um, it was really centred around our systemic anti-cancer therapy digital checklist. So for those of you who don't know, SACT is a capsule term for uh, therapies that are provided to cancer patients, whether that's chemotherapy, immunotherapy or targeted therapies. And we co-designed our solution with East Suffolk and North East Essex NHS Trust. And really the, the patients and clinicians in the um, Wolverston Cancer Centre this is really their idea, actually, that they came to us with. Um, and often, you know, innovations that are co-designed with clinicians and patients tend to have most impact. So we were thrilled to pitch this to the Macmillan team. And you know, we're really excited about scaling this um, within the NHS over the next few years. So a little bit about Humor. We're a global digital healthcare company. We're headquartered in London. So um, where the NHS is of uh, particular importance to us. We've been working with the health service for about 10 years. So currently there's about 65 NHS trusts who are using our remote monitoring technologies. We're also working extensively in primary care as well. So about two and a half thousand GP practices are using our patient engagement platforms. But we're not just a UK business anymore. We, we, we've scaled and we're, we're more global now. So we've got operations in the US, the EU and the Middle East as well. And Humus business is very much centered on two areas. One is around healthcare. So how do we use our remote monitoring technology to improve people's lives and deliver better outcomes for patients. And the other is really centered around research. So we work with a number of research institutions and life science organizations to accelerate adoption of their drugs or therapeutics to really um, in, in, in bring innovations to the front line so patients can you know, benefit from these uh, more sooner. So our remote monitoring technology is really simple. It's a smartphone facing patient app, which is what you'll see on the left hand side. Um, and a web browser based dashboard, which is what you'll see on the right hand side. And what we typically do is we work with care teams to co-design the right specification of our app to suit the pathway or the disease. So human technology, uh, whilst cancer is a sort of a significant priority for our business, the technology can be used for lots of other conditions as well, whether that's cardiovascular, you know, uh, diabetes, respiratory. It's a flexible platform that can support lots of different conditions. But the most important thing is we work with care teams to provide an adjunct to the way that they deliver services. So this isn't replacing face to face and in person care It's providing more capacity to help care providers so they can manage and monitor more patients in a safe and more effective way. So clinical teams can review the data that's entered by patients in a web browser based dashboard and the dashboard's got intelligence built into it. So what it does is it enables care teams to divert care to where it's needed most. And we have solutions like telemedicine and messaging built into it to improve communication whilst you know, patients are at home um, and you know, that they do need to receive treatment. They can engage with their care teams really easily. So the SACT program for us, as I mentioned, it sort of started with East Suffolk and North East Essex about nearly, nearly a year and a half ago now. And we were fortunate enough to work with the trust on a, on a large scale virtual ward program. And one of the areas that they were having significant challenges around was their SACT department. So the, the Wolverston Centre in East Suffolk was um, seeing about 500 patients a month who were coming in for their SACT therapy. But one of the big challenges they had was the nursing team were having to call patients uh, either one or two days before their next SAC therapy uh, to run through a checklist to run through a checklist with them so to almost assess whether they were fit for treatment and fit for their next uh, wave of um, of of, of, um, of SACs. And that was a really big challenge. It was they were undertaking about 80 to 100 calls every day, and it was taking nearly one and a half whole time equivalent of nursing time to run through a checklist with each patient. So what we did with the team is we, we co-designed a version of our app which digitized that checklist. And it was really simple. It was putting the question set that were, the nursing team were uh, running through the telephone with the patients around and also adding some other features and benefits to improve the experience of the patients whilst they were waiting for their SAP therapy. 
and the the impact almost immediately was quite astounding even even for, for, from our side so um, the nursing team were able to very quickly reduce the number of phone calls they were making um, they were able to free up clinical capacity almost immediately because the data was being proactively captured by patients and the feedback from patients was fantastic you know previously they were having to wait by the telephone to receive a call to then speak to a clinician uh, which we all know everyone's got busy lives you know there's lots of other stuff to be getting on with so the ability for patients to you know take this in, in their own stride and complete the checklist whenever they were ready and able to meant the care teams were no longer having to follow up and chase individuals what it also meant was there were fewer on the day cancellations for sat and that was a big issue for the trust because they were you know had people on the door who were, who were at the department ready to be treated but they weren't quite fit enough to be treated so they were being turned away, which you know was really awful experience for patients and added you know more challenges to the capacity that the trust had. So since we've gone live, we've had about the, the data is a bit out of date here. We've had nearly 400 patients go through the the, the, the platform at East Suffolk. Um, and what's really exciting from our perspective, um, there's two things really. The first is the digital exclusion aspect was, was always a worry when you introduce technology to care pathways. What we were able to evidence through the program was the majority of people were aged over 65 and um, the, 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 the oldest person who was using the technology was 91 years old. And what we found actually was that if you make the technology really simple to use, it's much more accessible for patients. I'm just going to go into a bit of detail about the sort of um, the, the, the solution that was deployed at, um, at ESNET. So from the patient's perspective, we had a range of features that were built to improve the way that the SAC service was delivering its, its care. So firstly, we created a key actions page, which is what you see on the left. And that's a really simple list of actions for patients to complete on, on an agreed frequency. So they know what they need to do when. It really helps drive adherence, which is really important when individuals are at home. We digitized the, 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 the checklist that was previously being uh, run through by uh, clinicians on the telephone. A really simple set of questions. There was about eight to 10 questions in total. And that really helped gather information to support the care team make a decision about the patient's readiness for their next SAT therapy. The, care, the patients were able to track their own data so they could see data points at their blood pressure, their resting heart rates. They could capture data directly from the smartphone without having to use peripheral devices which made their experience much, much easier. And one of the best features we, we sort of worked with the patients around was the learning educational section, which is this box here. And what was really great about this is we were able to digitize a lot of the content and leaflets that were shared with patients uh, on paper. And as we all know, really easy to lose paper. So having the information all loaded into an app, which was easy to access, was really fantastic. We also built in the fe uh, features to enable blood test bookings to be made directly from the Humor app. And that meant patients didn't need to call or log into different systems. They could book their, you know, their bloods directly from the smartphone without having to go, go elsewhere. And if they needed to, they could also add a helper. So again, to reduce the number of people who were excluded from the service, they could add someone to capture data on their behalf. And they could also upload documents and receive documents as well as engage with messaging with their care teams. And from a clinician perspective, um, what, what really transformed the way that they delivered care was they suddenly had a risk adjusted caseload of patients who were waiting for SAT. So rather than printing off a list and running through in alphabetical order uh, of the number of people they needed to speak to that day, they suddenly had this data proactively captured and it was organized in terms of priority. So patients who were entering symptoms um, or you know, health data points that exceeded agreed parameters were pushed higher up the caseload. And what that meant was the care teams could engage with patients who were most at need of support as opposed to you know just calling them to see how they were doing and it really helped improve the way that they delivered services and i, I remember speaking to the snf team at wolverston you know they, they, they there was no day where they ran their clinics to time they were always overrunning patients were having to wait three four sometimes five hours to be seen and that wasn't because the services you know weren't doing the best that they could it was just the way in which the services were configured meant there wasn't as much efficiency within within the department um, and, you know, since implementing Huma, they've been able to finish their clinics on time, um, which has been a really great key performance metric that we wanted to track was to really improve the clinician experience as well as the, as well as the patient experience as well. So what we wanted to do um, is to really understand the impact that the platform had in terms of hard data. And one of the key metrics that the NHS uses is time to treatment. 
So what we did is we looked at the data from ESNEF uh, compared to other similar size SAC departments. You see ESNEF in, in the sort of dark bar here. So these trusts are delivering similar volumes of SACs every month. This data is taken from January uh, 2023. And what you'll uh, 2024, sorry. And what you see on the left-hand side is the number of patients who are being seen. And the right-hand side is the number of people being treated within 62 days. And what we were able to identify at East Suffolk as a snapshot was they were seeing similar volumes of patients to these, to these other trusts, but the number of people they were seeing within 62 days was the highest out of their peers. And this was really, you know, we can't take full credit on the human side. There were lots of configurations that were happening at the trust, but we do know the solution has helped improve efficiency within the department, reduce on the day cancellations and really free up clinical capacity. So we understood the snapshot was, re was, was, was really effective, but then what we wanted to see was over time, how was the HUMA platform impacted first, but also subsequent treatments by month. So the first treatment is what you see on the left-hand side and the subsequent treatments on the right-hand side. So we implemented HUMA in May 2023, and what you'll see is a linear trend. So month on month, the dotted line is going up. So the number of people being seen for their first and subsequent treatments increasing which is great, more people are being seen, but also that's not the only metric. Whilst more people are being seen, they're also being seen within, six, uh, within the 62 day parameter, which is set by NHS England. So what we're really excited to do is take this data, you know, scale it into other NHS organisations, which is what we'll be doing um, as you know, winners of the Innovate Innovation Challenge with Macmillan. Um, that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Karen G. That's that's great. There are a couple of questions um, in the chat, which I'll go through. But if anybody else has got any questions for Karen G, just pop your hand up. Um, Katie's asked if you'll be able to share the slides, your slides um, or a, a version of. Is that possible? Of course. Yeah, they're very happy for the slides to be um, circulated and shared. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and Tambe has said, um, did you guys do a net promoter score? And if so, can you share it? Yeah, we can set, share the NPS data. Um, we we've, we've subsequently did a, a refresh of that information. So happy to update the slides and include that, of course. That's great. Thanks. Katie, you've got a question. Um, yeah, I've um, just got two actually. Um, I've only come across works on virtual wards in like cardiology or frailty um, settings. So I've not obviously so apologies if the questions aren't quite um, applicable um, but how do you actually um, look at the suitability of the patients for actual virtual ward and using this technology um, just thinking that you know you have some patients who have like things around reasonable adjustments um, I know a lot in like frailty there's a huge amount of um, assessment done by the clinician about the patient's suitability to go into that settings and if they've got the right support around and if they actually need sometimes a physical carer to go in to do some of this. So just thinking, obviously, is it, do you have a process for actually identifying suitability? So, you know, especially if you're doing sort of stratify who can actually, um, you know, on their sort of clinics and everything can using patient reported information about the suitability of some patients for doing that. Um, so that's one question. Um, and then secondly, what process do you have for actually, especially because you're doing that sort of like stratifying about which patients based on need and everything about sort of monitoring the performance of that. So I've seen in sort of some uh, diagnostic AI tools where they have sort of like um, uh, like a post surveillance monitoring audit process and everything. Just wondering about that sort of like, you know, process for that, because you are obviously and, and that's obviously why you've got your medical device status, too, because obviously you are informing clinical decision making. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. So firstly, in terms of the um, inclusion exclusion criteria, so we work with the clinical teams to uh, almost almost set those up. So the clinicians and the nursing team are the ones that are, um, you know, stratifying the patient list and understanding which ones are suitable for the technologies. And let's be honest, the technology is not suitable for everyone. So the care teams are the ones you know, as, as a joint decision making with the patient to decide who's suitable for the interventions. You know, we do things like adding the option for someone to add a carer. So if they have a smartphone but aren't capable of using it or don't want to use it, someone else can enter data on their behalf. But really, the, 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 the clinical teams and the oncology departments are the ones that decide who, who is suitable. But I think typically, from our technology perspective, this intervention is really simple. 
Um, you know, there's, there's not that much needed for the patient. It's simply a questionnaire alongside the ability to book bloods and look at educational information. So the access criteria is um, probably lower compared to maybe a frailty virtual ward, which requires, you know, much more intensive support for individuals. Um, so that answer your first question, Katie. Um, yeah, and just so that's really helpful. Um, I just very quickly just realised I forgot to ask if um, you have it in different languages, because um, obviously it's in English and um, obviously I'm from, uh, I work in North Central London. Um, and we have a huge amount of uh, non-English speakers. So obviously that's probably one health inequality we'd be really interested in looking at. Yeah, we do. So the solution is available in multiple different languages. So as because as a global company, you know, we've got deployments in the Middle East, for example, in Germany and Spain. So there is a, a I can share a list with you of the languages it's available in. There's always more to be added, to be frank. You know, uh, we're fortunate enough to live in a really diverse country. So, you know, there are other languages we need to add into it. But there are a, a number that do satisfy the majority of um, the NHS organisations that we work with. But typically they are is deployed in English as a starting point. And then, you know, we look to, we look to other languages based on local needs. Um, does that answer that question? You had one more, Katie, sorry. And it was around the uh, medical device side of things. It was, yeah, it was about that sort of post-market surveillance because it can be a bit um, woolly sometimes how I've seen that being like used in practice and things. So it's obviously just having that um especially with the clinical community is about you know when you're doing that decision support actually how accurate is it and you know how do you actually track that it's obviously making the right yeah, yeah. and is performing just as well as sort of you know if you had obviously you know if, especially if you're sort of moving in terms of priority um how does it perform compared to Absolutely. what the existing le level of thing is so it's obviously that sort of and obviously at the moment it's realistically going to be just by staff there's no sort of other tools used very often for sort of doing this. I mean, I've come across, um, yeah, I've seen a few sort of prioritization tools, but they're mm -hmm. in elective surgery and not really in this space. So just really interested in that sort of like that um, monitoring process. Yeah, so from our perspective, so we, we hold ourselves to the regulators uh, quite stringently. So our platform's an EU MDR class 2B medical device. Um, I didn't go into too much detail about this, but it's the highest classification for a disease agnostic remote patient monitoring solution available. And what that really means in real terms is we've um, we've cu cu curated a really rich evidence base. So the regulators are the ones assessing our um, efficacy of prioritization. But it also gives us much more flexibility as we move forward. Uh, we partner with lots of different technology companies that have got really fantastic risk algorithms. As a class 2B medical device, we can incorporate those algorithms into our solution in a regulated way. Um, so the ongoing process of post-market surveillance is, I mean, it's ongoing, it never ends. We're constantly working with the regulators, not just in the EU, but in, in, in the US, in the Middle East, in Australia, where we've got the same level of classification. So that's really important to us, but it's a never ending process. We've got a large regulation team that makes sure we adhere to those the relevant standards. Um, but because there is so much innovation happening in this space, you know, we, we always look to partner with companies that have created their own risk alg algorithms. In some cases, our NHS partners have created their own within their academic sort of centres too. So our platform has the flexibility to incorporate those. But typically as a starter for 10, the, the prioritisation process is relatively linear, you know, where patients have more red flags that ex exceed agreed parameters. And that's decided by the care teams, the ones that are looking at the data. That's how the sort of process works. But over time, we look to provide more intelligence into that to make it, you know, even more sophisticated. Now, that's really helpful. Um, is there the functionality as well for, say, if I'm in Essex, looking at and having a report about, you know, how is this sort of um, performing? And obviously, it's a thing with a medical device is always like, how do you identify something when it's gone wrong? So what is sort of like a never event? And I know I've sometimes struggled with AI companies, especially about like, how do you define what is sort of a never event in your situation and how do we define it? Because obviously if you can't define it, you can't report on it and we can't track it. So um, it would just be good to understand that too. Yeah, of course. Um, so again, you know, when we deploy in local systems, we agree what the key metrics, uh, things like never events, what they are, what they look like. 
Um, and then we, you know, we go away and then understand what we can do within our technology to support those things. Some things are really easy to set up so we can report on. Other things are a bit more complicated, as you just described. So, you know, we do take it on a local needs basis. Uh, but there are standard KPIs that we track as a as a medical device. Um, other things can be added. It just sometimes takes a bit longer to develop those things. Thanks, uh, Karen Jett, and thanks, Katie. There's one more question um, in the chat uh, it, asking about the options for further rollout. So plans and options for the further rollout of this. And if trusts and re um, or regions are interested, how do they follow up? Well, there is a survey link um, that Richard's posted in the chat for humour. And if you add your details to that, we'll link you up with the innovators today um, and start those conversations with you. But Karen Jett, uh, just quickly, plans or options for further rollout? Yeah, so obviously with the Macmillan funding we've received, we're looking to deploy the solution in, in probably one other trust this year. Um, but we're also actively speaking to another number of NHS organisations about further rollout. So if you are interested, you know, we'd, we'd love to have a conversation. One of the other sort of aspects we can bring is our connections into the life science world. Um, these pharma companies are really interested in SACT, particularly in the oral SACT uh, pathways because their drugs and therapeutics are being used. Um, so if funding is an issue, um, and I know that is a significant issue at the moment, we do have alternative mechanisms to fund some of these programmes. So um, yeah, for, for the moment we're working with Macmillan on one other trust, but we'd love to have conversations with other organisations who might be interested. Thanks, Karen. I think you just said the word free. Did anybody else hear that? <laughs> it's, it's a free don't thing. Don't quote me on that. Yeah, it could be. It could be, which is which is nice. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and, and you're on later with it with another product of yours. So we'll see you again. Thank you very much. Um, next, we've got uh, Dockler. Is Chloe in the room? Chloe, I am. Are you there? Yes, Hi, I'm Chloe. Here. Hello. Uh, nice to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Um, would you like to share your screen? Yes, I will do. Can you see that? Oh. Yeah, that's perfect, Chloe. Thanks. Thanks Over to you. Me. Thanks, Vanessa. And um, hi, everybody. My name is Chloe Smithers. I am one of Doppler's senior partnerships and managers. Um, who is Doppler? We are a virtual care organisation that provides remote monitoring across Europe. We're the leading remote monitoring provider within the UK. We support over 40% of ICBs within NHS England. We deploy the national contract to NHS Wales. We are working with the two main acute trusts in Ireland and are currently deploying with NHS Lancashire in Scotland. That's all to say that we have experience working with a whole range of teams um, across the acute community and primary care settings. And we support them to remotely monitor patients across the acuity spectrum, providing a smooth continuum of care from those patients who are stable and well and self-managing a long-term condition within a primary care setting to those who are at rising risk of admission and require safety netting, often at that interface between primary and community care, as well as providing a route, to alternative, a route of alternative to admission or early discharge through virtual ward pathways. You'll see here that I've put two definitions on screen. Those are prescribed by NHS England, but they're very much not two distinct and discrete buckets. There's a continuum that sits between the two, especially so for cancer patients. Jacqueline, thanks so much for sharing your experience of, of coming in and out of hospital. And we hope a platform like Doppler could provide a smooth transition for that. How do we do that? How do we support? We like to think of ourselves as providing end-to-end -end virtual care. What I mean by this is that we really don't believe um, that technology is the silver bullet for innovation. You need to have technology that fits holistically within wider service provision. And because of that, we provide a whole range of services in addition to the technology. I'll talk through each of these buckets here, but don't treat them as a one size fits all. They're combined in various different ways um, by the partners that we work with to make sure they're deployed most effectively for teams on the ground. Firstly, um, the hardware and logistics. We do not manufacture any devices. We do that intentionally. We believe it's best that we horizon scan for best in class devices on the market. There are always new emerging technologies that are appearing that can monitor um, in new and novel ways. Um, so we look to integrate those directly within our patient app so that vital signs can be continuously 
or intermittently captured by patients remotely. We also provide the logistics for making sure that those devices are calibrated, functionality tested, cleaned and de decontaminated according to IPAC standards and getting into the hands of patients as soon as they need them. We also arrange collection of those devices once a patient is discharged from the pathway, meaning that the clinical teams that we work with can get on with care delivery rather than dealing with the nuts and bolts of, of service provision for remote monitoring. Those vital signs are inputted into a patient facing app that then feeds into a clinical facing dashboard. The dashboard rag prioritise the data so that it's really clear to the clinician when a patient is deteriorating. They can view that data over time. That data is um, processed through an intelligent alerts engine. So it's really clear if the patient is sitting inside or outside of expected range for them on an individual basis. And also the vital signs that um, appear within that dashboard are integrated directly within our clinical team's EHR, uh, whether that's EMIS, System 1, EPIC, CERNA, we ensure that the data that sits within the Doppler dashboard is, can then be coded into the patient's medical record. So that's the software and the hardware that we provide, um, but that technology um, is also supported by a wraparound service layer that reports directly to our chief medical officer, we have a whole range of customer service agents who are trained much like HCAs so that they can support patients to be onboarded to the service, that they can help provide technical troubleshooting should the patients have any queries or concerns, and also that they can follow up if a patient has missed a reading. Um, the, our customer service team are notified through blue alerts within our dashboard. They then contact the patients to make sure that they are able to submit. And that service provision is available 365 days a year. In addition to that, we are a CQC registered provider and we provide clinical monitoring capacity. Our specialist remote monitoring clinicians range from health coaches through to band five, six, seven nurses, as well as advanced nurse practitioners, advanced paramedic practitioners um, and acute consultants, as well as having GP oversight. The reason I say that effectively is that there is an MDT that sits around um, the technology to make sure that your clinical teams have a first point of triage so that when they um, review the data that they know that it's been interrogated first. How does this support cancer patients? Um, it's, it's really clear that cancer and experience of cancer is not homogenous. There are a whole range of experiences depending on type of cancer, the stage of diagnosis, and a person's experience of cancer can change over their time during their treatment. As such, it's really important that the technology and the service provision can adapt and be agile to those changing and different needs. I'm signposted three different um, items here that we focus on to enable that flexibility, but there are many more for time. I won't talk to them, but I'd love to speak in person for anybody who's interested. Firstly, as I mentioned, we are device agnostic. That means that there isn't a limit to the nature of the data that we can collect. Our questionnaire builder is has been developed on a no code or low code basis. What that means is that it's entirely customizable. All the branching logic of the questions that are posed to patients, the type of inputs that required of them, whether that be soft signs, for example, them entering multiple choice, a free text, a pain scale. Um, but as in addition to that, we are also able to integrate uh, news two observations. We've integrated six lead ECGs. We can integrate blood testing. But as a device agnostic provider, if you as a clinician see a device that you think could be particularly interesting, then it, we have um, a team within our R&D department that are dedicated to working on those integrations to make sure that that data can easily get into our patient app. So that's point number one, how, how we can collect various different types of data. Number two, the clinical dashboard is highly customised according to the patient pathway that's being supported, as well as at an individual patient level. What I mean by that is that our intelligent alerts engine can colour flag on a variety of different bases. So um, you might want for certain pathways um, a red alert or an amber alert to only appear if a patient has submitted several readings in a row that indicate um, an observation out of range. We would call that an aggregate alert. You might want it that if a patient is being continuously monitored through a patch on their chest, that it's only if their respiratory rate 
um, deteriorates for five minutes or longer, that that's when there is a red alert because you wouldn't want it to alert if they were just walking up the stairs or they weren't at rest. Or alternatively, you might want it that it's on an absolute basis. The patient is highly acute and if they if a reading is outside of range, you want an immediate sensitive red alert alarm to notify clinicians that there is a cause for concern. That's entirely customizable in terms of the type of alerts, but also the thresholds that sit around each patient can be changed. What this means is that it enables you to detect signs of complication early and to intervene early. And finally, and I think touching on what Jacqueline spoke to, um, it's really important to us that patients and their next of kin can become co-owners of their own care, that they feel in charge and in control where they are able to be. Because of that, we have a range of different communication tools within the R app. We provide video and two-way messaging functionality. Within the app, there is signposting to additional device uh, advice, um, which is again entirely customizable. It might be that you want to signpost them to nutritional information, to materials on sleep hygiene, to videos on how they can take certain medication and to notify them of certain side effects. All of that is entirely customizable according to the regions that we work with, the patients that we work with. It also, the app enables patients to see their data trends over time so that they can start to understand their own triggers and they can see when their results have been reviewed so that they have the reassurance that there are clinical eyes on them, albeit remotely. And finally, we do know that cancer patients often have to experience a whole range of different appointments. So there is a calendar functionality within the app that reminds them of those appointments. There are a range of system benefits um, that we've seen um, since monitoring over 4 million patient days. Most importantly, we know that patient satisfaction is incredibly high. 97% of patients are satisfied or very satisfied and engagement with the platform is really strong. 96% patient compliance means patients are submitting readings when they're expected, expected to submit. This has a range of savings as well for NHS teams, a reduction in ED admission, in bed days, and importantly, an increase in clinical capacity because you can adjust the patient uh, to staff ratios that you're working with. I think speaking to um, some of the discussion um, in the previous presentation, there's a really important point here about health inequalities. We know that every, not everybody's experience of care is equal and there are certain cohorts where there is an unmet need. We are able to translate our app into a variety of different languages. We're led by the communities that we work with on which languages are most pertinent. Um, an example strikes me most recently that we were working on a project where Somali and Polish groups were most impacted. And so we therefore translated materials into Somali and Polish. Equally, um, we're really proud of the fact that we have a range of different mechanisms in place to support digital inclusion and to ensure that in the most deprived communities are able to engage, most notably on a program that we work with, um, worked with Bristol on recently, 40% of patients were from IMD deciles one to three, i.e. they were the most deprived communities within Bristol that were being onboarded and supported by the service. And there's a range of different ways that we can do that. Um, but just to pick on one, we provide uh, 4G enabled smartphones and tablets by default which means that there is no expectation on patients to have their own smart device if they don't and there's no expectation for them to um, have Wi-Fi or to pay data charges to run the app. We provide the 4G sims. I will stop there because of time um, but please do ask questions or get in touch. Really keen to continue the discussion. Thanks. Thanks Chloe, um, that was perfect. Um, and it feels like a very bespoke offer. So thank you for that. Has anybody got any questions for Chloe? She ran perfectly to time. So um, if you do have any and you think of any, just pop in the chat. Um, if you do pop any, any questions in the chat for a previous innovator, just mark who the technology is that you're asking the question to specifically. Um, and then we will move on to our next innovator, who is um, Sciences uh, and Vine Health. And it's Megan. Is Megan in the room with us? Yep. Yeah, hello. Hi, um, Megan. I've, hi, thank you. Um, I've also got my colleague uh, Victoria with me today as well, so we're going to be a double act. Hi, Victoria. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, you've shared your screen. That's perfect. Thank you. Over to you. 
Excellent, thank you. All right. So a little bit about us. Um, so Sciences has over 30 years of experience and it stands at a leading provider of pharmaceutical services known for delivering impactful healthcare solutions. We combine our deep understanding of patient needs and healthcare dynamics to deliver comprehensive solutions across four key domains. As you can see on the slides, we've got support across chronic illnesses, cancer, rare diseases, and patient insights. And with all this, we strive to consistently drive positive outcomes. Sciences has made significant investments in recent years to build an integrated portfolio of advanced patient engagement and real world evidence solutions, enhancing both patient connectivity and clinical insights. And in January of this year, Sciences strengthened this approach by acquiring Vine Health, um, expanding its digital health and well being platform capabilities. So now that it's been rebranded as a Sciences Cancer Companion, the Vine Health platform um, empowers cancer patients to better self-manage and take control of their journey. At the same time, it captures valuable patient-generated data to assist clinicians in delivering more effective, personalized cancer care. It's a really um, exciting addition to our portfolio. Um, the platform is one of the leading cancer tools in the UK, and it's driving significant improvements in patient outcomes and medicine performance. So we know that evidence generation is really important for demonstrating patient and clinical value, particularly when it comes to reducing appointments, uh, saving time, and utilizing um, services in a more optimum manner. And we're really investing in this. And so here we're just going to highlight two of ex two examples of our evidence generation, what we've been working on. So we conducted a feasibility study with the Royal Marsden, where we saw 97% patient engagement in study improvements in medication, um, adherence compared to literature, and patients reported improved quality of life as well. We also undertook an RCT to evaluate a number of objectives. Um, we've got a poster being presented at the upcoming ESMO conference on this, which is also quite exciting. And um, what we were looking at is included the quality of life, self-management, and healthcare utilization, such as um, appointments if they weren't attended, medication adherence, unplanned admissions, as well as exploratory objectives through qualitative interviews. Um, and as a company, we're focusing on producing robust evidence in close collaboration with our partners. We've extended our contracts with Cromwell, Leeds, and currently engaging with UCLH on a second contract um, and doing a bit of co-design at the moment with them. Hi. Um, so today I'm just going to chat through some of the challenges um, that we all know the oncology services face. So I suppose primarily clinical teams face a significant challenge in managing um, patient care in between appointments where, as we all know, 99% of the lived experience actually happens. And so sometimes this gap can lead to several critical issues. Um, Firstly, like looking at outpatient capacity, we know that there is scope to monitor perhaps routine follow up appointments more effectively or remotely. Um, and it's really important when we put that in the context of there are over 2.2 million people currently waiting for um, access to cancer care. Secondly, unplanned visits, so around 50% of cancer patients A&E attendances are potentially preventable. Um, which those only sort of add to stress to the oncology services, but also the wider um, hospital operational services as well. And lastly, around patient experience. So um, we know that one in three patients can feel overwhelmed or inadequately, inadequately informed about their side effects. Um, and people aren't given helpful information sometimes at diagnosis or um, sort of sufficient or a lack of sufficient information to allow them to engage in discussing their care plan um, and doing that in collaboration with their clinical care team. And so this can really lead to um, difficulties with self-management for people experiencing cancer. So being able to address these gaps is crucial and there is some evidence out there to show that by enabling people um, to track things like their symptoms and their medications can have a positive impact on survival rates as well. 
So how does the Cancer Companion address some of these challenges? So our solution consists of two key components for people experiencing cancer. And we've got the Science is Cancer Companion app. And this really allows users to um, empower them to track, manage and understand um, the different aspects of their care and will provide them with the tools that they need for effective self-management. And for healthcare professionals, um, we've got the Sciences Pro dashboard, and this tool allows um, clinical teams to be able to view and understand patient reported data, which allows them then to sort of enhance clinical decision making and supports really a more holistic approach to care. Um, and we're really excited that we are one of the highest rated um, cancer tools by ORCA. Um, ORCA is an independent body. And they've sort of judged that um, based on the robustness of a regulatory re approach and positive feedback from patients and clinicians. And here you can see some of the other regulatory approvals that we have achieved, um, which really kind of showcases our confidence and success in being able to meet um, NHS requirements to ensure that we're operating to the highest standards. So I'm going to hand back over to uh, Tori now, and she's going to go through the app in a little bit more detail. Thanks, Megan. So our Scientist Cancer Companion patient app really puts the patient's health in their hands. It's designed to support people outside of the hospital um, and it engages and empowers patients to take control of their health by giving them um, control over tracking and managing of their disease. So I'm just going to run through a few of our key features that we want to highlight. Uh, so treatment regimes can be quite complex to manage. And we offer the capability to set recurring medication reminders to better adhere to the medications. Um, unintentional non-adherence of medication, it can limit the benefits of the meds, resulting in a lack of improvement um, or deterioration in health. People can input the medication they need to take and the app will then schedule reminders as required throughout the day. It could also be based off of cycles. Um, and users can note whether they've taken the medication too. So it gives the users um, a, a better way to manage um, when there's a lot going on. So users can record any symptoms, side effects, and well being in a more convenient, consistent way outside of the hospital. Uh, the app's designed to support users with highly accessible and tailored guidance to support their understanding. And one example of this is if they uh, say that they've got um, a high grade symptom, then we've got a configurable pop up, which we can work closely with the care team to um, decide what they how they want to direct the patient. And so it gives some additional signposting to the patients for some support. Other capabilities we have, um, we integrate with wearables and we also have some report functionality. Um, we know that people affected by cancer, it extends much further than the individual with the diagnosis. And as such, we've got a report section within the app, which provides an overview of information and put into the app over a given period of time. Um, the user can then download this and share with the wider circle of care. Um, it just helps them feel reassured and allows them to have additional support and communication with those in, involved in their care. We also have the um, capability for users to access the right information whenever and wherever they need it. So it's there's easy to digest evidence based information where we provide the information on a wide range of topics from a number of trusted charity partners. So we work quite closely with our partners here um, and we can personalize it to users needs and we focus quite closely on just bite sized content. So it's easily digestible and understandable. For the users. And then we also can capture standardized patient outcomes throughout their care journey through the use of patient reported outcome measures. And one of the good things about integrating EPROMS is that it could provide a more complete picture of the user's health status and quality of life. I um, mean, it enables early detection and management of side effects. Uh, it can facilitate data-driven discussions between patients and healthcare teams. And then I think really important, it can support the personalization of the care plan based off of the reported outcomes and can help um, engage, patients engage with their consultants. With that, I'm going to hand off to Megan to discuss the portal and the um, care team side of things. Thank you. Um, yeah, so when connected to the Sciences Pro dashboard, the app gives clinical teams um, insights into real time longitudinal data um, 
for their patients' health. So it really allows them to provide tailored content and guidance, um, like Troy just mentioned, ensuring that um, their patients get the right information when they need it um, without maybe having to contact or visit the hospital. So by having um, some of this patient reported data sort of at their fingertips, it becomes easier then for clinical teams to be able to spot potential issues early on um, and therefore can impact the sort of these unplanned visits and reduce the likelihood of those happening. Um, and it also empowers clinical teams to tailor guidance and interventions a little bit more effectively which will, you know, and does improve the overall patient experience. And the proactive approach doesn't always, doesn't only improve patient outcomes, but also sort of optimises outpatient um, capacity as well. So being able to ensure that care is delivered efficiently and where it's needed most um, for people with cancer. So sort of in short, these real-time visualisations enable more informed and timely decision making and they directly tackle the gaps um, that we have sort of within patient monitoring and support. One of the critical issues that um, I mentioned earlier on was, you know, some of that high number of preventable A&E visits, which pl places additional strain on sort of the wider um, hospital services. And this can often happen because high risk patients um, maybe aren't identified and supported early enough um, through early intervention. So the dashboard really addresses this by allowing clinical teams then to quickly identify and focus on those patients who require immediate attention. And through the symptom severity um, data that you can see on the dashboard, it allows um, clinical teams to sort and prioritise the patients based on the real time data that comes through um, and ensures that critical cases can be addressed promptly. And I suppose by focusing on high risk patients, we help to manage um, patient loads more effectively um, and then alleviating per, uh, pressure on the healthcare services. Um, and then the final slide on this um, is just around, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how patients can be overwhelmed with information and feel maybe a little bit um, unsupported in managing their care. And with our, the signposting feature that um, Tori mentioned earlier, if patients log a specific symptom or maybe a high temperature, they are guided to the right support based on what they have reported. So we work with clinical teams to understand the pathways that they want um, patients to go on. And this really sort of enhances the support then that patients receive throughout their journey. And then the final slide that we've got is um, just some testimonials. So I think nothing really speaks better to the impact of our solution than those who have experienced it firsthand. So we've got a few testimonials from patients and um, clinicians as well who have seen the difference that Cancer Companion can make um, to their journeys. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Victoria. Thank that was perfect. You ran perfectly to time. Um, has anybody got any questions? No, it was really, really detailed. And I think your point at the end about it being overwhelming, I think often we, you know, we feel overwhelmed by technology in itself, don't we? So, you know, streamlining it and making it easier for patients is, is key in these things. Thanks again. Um, if you want to stop sharing the screen. Um, next on the list, we have a company called Febris. Um, unfortunately, they're not able to join us today, um, but we do have uh, a link to um, uh, in slides. I sent some slides out um, prior to the meeting uh, and there's a link with details on for them. If you do want to um, get in touch with them, you can also contact us and we'll put you in touch with Febris. Um, and now we're going to go back to humour. Um, Karen Jit, are you there? I'm probably telling you, you were probably not ready for that, were you? You were thinking you were not going to be next. <laughs> I was just about to go and grab a coffee, so I'm really glad I, I didn't do that. It would have been a bit of a nightmare. I'm so sorry. I should have told you that at the beginning, <laughs> shouldn't I? Are you ready no to worries. share your next innovation with us? 
Yes, we are. Um, thank, yeah, you. thank you very much. Um, and uh, apologies you're hearing from me again. So hopefully my voice doesn't get too too boring for you all. But the second innovation that we put forward for the challenge was um, a really interesting, almost like research led program that we co-developed with the Royal Marsden and Chelsea and Westminster NHS Foundation Trust. And they were particularly interested in steroid induced hyperglycemia during chemotherapy. So a really big challenge that patients face uh, when they're treated with dexamethasone, uh, which is an adjunct to SAP therapies, increased levels of blood glucose or blood sugars, sorry. And even if you don't have diabetes already, there is still a, a, an, an increase in a risk of your blood sugars being elevated during your SAP therapy. And they were really interested in seeing is, is there ways that remote care and virtual care can help better manage um, this side effect for people who are undergoing um, SAT. You, I won't go through this slide because you've seen it already. So the big challenge that uh, the teams in the NHS wanted us to sort of um, understand if we could design a solution around was how can we uh, better improve the experience for individuals who are who who have hyperglycemia post SAT. So this pathway really sets out the, the standard pathway deployed across the whole NHS. So on day one, a patient receives their, their SAT treatment. Uh, on days one to three, if needed, they are um, pre uh, prescribed high dose dexamethasone, uh, which could be you know, typically steroids. Um, and it's really used as an anti-sickness therapy to help manage side effects of, 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 of the chemotherapy that's being, that's being administered. But the really big challenge is up to nearly 66% of patients have hyperglycemia post-SAT. The majority of these patients do have diabetes or diabetes risk factors, um, but often they don't have any access to self-monitoring. And that's a really big burden on the healthcare system, particularly primary care. So when we speak to GPs, they often, uh, you know, they're, they're managing patients who are undergoing SAT. Um, and a lot of these patients who are suffering from high blood glucose or elevated blood glucose levels, they need to go in to see their GP to be, to be treated or diagnosed, uh, or even sometimes admitted to A&E if their symptoms are really severe. And this is a really big sort of challenge for the NHS, um, particularly even in this sort of relatively niche area of cancer care, because often people don't have, they don't know that they have high blood glucose levels until they get tested. So one of the sort of research questions that the Chelsea and Westminster team and Royal Marsden team wanted to, to us to assess is whether we could um, almost operationalize the guidelines that have been set in the NHS. So the Joint British Diabetes Society and UMA, UK Chemo Board developed better guidelines to help try and solve this problem. So when it gets to sort of post-treatment, the guidelines talk about um, home blood glucose monitoring, but there isn't really a remote monitoring solution that can operationalize this in a, in a low cost um, and highly effective way. So what we designed effectively um, is a, a, it's another platform that we have within our portfolio, which is called DBM Health. And it stands for diabetes management for, for, for an individual's health. And again, it's very simple to all the technologies that have been described today. There's a smartphone facing patient application which connects to a blood glucose meter um, and that uh, captures the data via Bluetooth. So the, the, the blood glucose in this, this example and that data is transmitted to a web browser based dashboard so care teams can prioritize the care that's needed. Um, and what we were really excited about trying to sort of evidence was when you implement a technology solution like DBM Health, you can really start to personalize the treatment for those who are affected by high blood glucose levels post discharge. And one of the most exciting things that we found for a pilot study was by using DBM Health, we can really help avoid preventable admissions and really enhance patient experience. But also on the primary care lens as well, we can alleviate pressures on general practice. We all know how difficult it is to get a, a GP appointment these days. So the idea of DBM Health is to almost divert those patients to back to their cancer department so they can be seen and treated in a much more effective and efficient way. They don't need to wait one week or two weeks to be seen by a GP or you know, even worse, be admitted into A&E to be, to be treated for their, their blood glucose levels during SACT. So the benefits of DBM Health is that we, we connect to a widely available glucose meter that's available on all the uh, formularies. So really that the device itself and the strips are fully funded by the sort of prescriptions that are provided to patients. Again, it connects to um, any pretty much any smartphone. So whether that's iOS or Android. Um, and most importantly, it really helps spot early intervention. I'm um, sorry, it helps spot um, early signs of blood glucose levels uh, increasing. 
So the interventions can be put in place uh, as an adjunct to their SAP therapy to really help manage the holistic needs of individuals as opposed to just treating you know, one specific area. And for us, again, you know, this team's come up a lot. Health inequalities is a really big area within, you know, remote monitoring and virtual care. And one of the things that we noticed during the pilot of this program we ran in South East London was that uh, people who are from black and Asian communities who are receiving SAT are at a higher risk or have higher risk factors for steroid induced hyperglycemia. Um, and that's pr primarily driven um, by genetics, but there are other risk factors too. So what we wanted to do was co-design a solution which was really targeted on specific cohorts, including things like language, uh, leaflet support, to really help localise and engage these individuals who might be at risk of worse outcomes if their blood glucose wasn't managed during their SAP therapy. And we have some really great, um, so we've got a really great case study from South East London and one of the um, diabetes uh, consultants really um, who used the te technology, she was really thrilled about the impact it had, particularly around improving patient experience, but from an efficiency and pathway perspective, it reduced the number of readmissions by nearly, I think is about 30%. So a reduction in the number of people having to go into hospital during their SAC therapy to be treated for, for hyperglycemia. So we know that the, the evidence base is re relatively small for this area. It, it is quite a niche area um, within cancer care, but we do see, uh, I mean, the clinical teams in the Marsden and, and Chelsea and Westminster in particular are seeing an uptick in a number of people who are, um, who are having steroid induced hyperglycemia as, a, as an outcome to their SAC therapy. So, you know, we're really keen to utilize this technology in, in a different way to support cancer care. And one of the things that we've been working on on the HUMA side is to in integrate this, these features into our standard HUMA SAT platform. So really the patient experiences, if they do have or at risk of steroid induced hyperglycemia, they can utilize the, the SAT platform that we've built within HUMA to monitor their blood glucose, which is a much better patient experience when you've only got one platform to, 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 you know, to manage multiple parts of your, of your care. That's it for me, short, um, a bit shorter perhaps, but if anyone's got any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you, Karen Jett. Um, any questions from anybody? You're getting some hand claps anyway. I think you can go and get your coffee now. Thank you and sorry for, <laughs> sorry for putting you on the spot there. We'll move on to our next innovator, our final innovator, um, which is Definition Health and Sandeep. Sandeep, are you there? I, I am here. Apologies, I'm uh, just demuting myself. Um, thank Hi, you. Hi, Sandy. Uh, Thanks for joining us. I'll Do you want to share your up, screen? Uh, absolutely. Perfect. I'll bring up the rear, um, so to speak, and I'm really think stopping you from coffee and lunch. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for uh, uh, the uh, offer of speaking to you regarding uh, definition health. Um, we're really transforming surgical care uh, for surgical cancer patients through uh, digital care navigation, data and AI. And as you're probably aware, over 80% of uh, cancer patients have some form of surgical intervention. And when we think about that surgical intervention and the adjuvant therapy, whether it be SAC, radiotherapy or other things, uh, we need to think about the patient. And Jacqueline gave an amazing uh, description about her non-surgical uh, cancer, uh, and that's from the start of their diagnosis right through to the virtual ward. Virtual wards use in isolation, as we found, uh, are clearly useful, but are, are really um, weak if they used to use in isolation and not within the entire pathway of the patient journey and their patient engagement. Um, as opposed to tech company, we're very much led by NHS innovators. Um, so I'm a surgeon, um, I've always got a co-founder, a, a radiologist. Uh, we're deeply embedded within the NHS in our day-to-day -day lives. And our whole cancer uh, pathway has been uh, helped and developed by Audrey, who is a Macmillan Cancer Specialist Nurse and Head of Breast uh, uh, Services at the University Hospital Sussex. And we're supported by a, a really good tech team, which has helped us deliver a patient-centric uh, solution. And if we thought about, if we think about it, uh, and think about the pathway uh, and where virtual wards fit in for the patients, really, uh, what we have to understand is the problems that we face. Obviously, a cancer diagnosis is a bombshell for patients, uh, and at that point, whether they're having surgical or non-surgical therapy, 
the engagement patients, not through their fault or their, their caregiver support, uh, is poor only because the amount of information they retain uh, is uh, understandably uh, difficult during a very difficult time and that leads to levels of huge anxiety. And actually, for whatever treatment they undergo, uh, and particularly surgical treatments, the support they get in the post-recovery uh, phase uh, is often insufficient as you combine post-surgical uh, care with uh, adjuvant therapy, uh, whether it be SAC or radiotherapy, depending on what types of cancer they have. The problems we face as clinicians is obviously we are often missing tests. So with our, our greater fragmentation of our services, uh, patients are seen in various sites, so we don't necessarily have all the information available to us. That leads to poor coordination sometimes and difficult coordination. We've experienced that within our own NHS hospital amongst surgical and non-surgical teams, uh, and that leads to missed hospital opportunities. So we already developed a pathway solution which is used in 20 different UK hospital sites. Over 300,000 patients have used it, and it's really an end-to-end -end platform which encompasses the very start of the patient journey, so their very first contact with uh, their clinical teams, whether it be the oncologist, the uh, cancer surgeon, uh, the specialist Macmillan nurses, uh, and it enables the patient to be followed in one platform from the beginning right through to the end, um, including smart questionnaires, whether it be for surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, uh, prior to that, uh, allowing us to optimise that patient wherever they are on that patient journey, allowing clinical review, triage features, which are standard along their journey with smart dashboards, which can alert us to various conditions uh, to the patient, uh, as well as educational media that we can deliver to them um, all, all the time. And our virtual ward where patients can enter and because they've started the journey, they already know they're going into a virtual ward, they know what to expect uh, and they know that's part of their care. Uh, and they feel very, very reassured uh, that they are actually being followed up in their virtual ward uh, because they know about it straight from the beginning. Um, all of that during a complete pathway produces really insightful data, which I think is going to be game changing for us uh, throughout our, our uh, surgical uh, arena. And what that gives us is really engaged patients uh, in terms of they're in a really difficult space, uh, but we find they have huge amounts of patient satisfaction, uh, enhanced post-operative recovery functions. Uh, despite uh, the surgery or chemotherapy or radiotherapy that they're having, uh, and we can optimise their pathways, so enabling the surgeons, the anaesthetists, the nursing staff, the community staff, the uh, Macmillan nurses, all to take part because the patients have one platform in their entire journey, uh, which imp improves patient coordination, it improves efficiency. Um, and one example of that was uh, the Royal Surrey, uh, which is where we use, it enables their teams, uh, for example, to treat uh, 16 um, uh, prostate cancer patients in one day, and then have their entire aftercare done within the virtual ward. So it maximises hospital pathways uh, uh, going forward. There's a huge amount of patient accessibility, uh, easy navigation. Uh, it's not the time consuming, it's very comprehensive. So patients like it uh, throughout the, the range. And this was a independent uh, real world economic study actually performed by Kenser and Sussex uh, via Unity Insights. Uh, and there's huge amounts of cost benefit. So using a comprehensive platform across the entire patient journey uh, really produces significant results on ROI investment. So it has a 48% ROI with a £1.50 return on every pound we invest in. It's also huge in terms of the power transformation. So uh, one award uh, was last year's uh, HSJ Partnership Award, which demonstrated that pathway solutions are really uh, the way forward, uh, which incorporate uh, the virtual award itself. Uh, and this was from last night, uh, where a different hospital won uh, the virtual award uh, awards at HSJ for safety and improvement technology and the best remote care initiative of the year. So what did we want to do? Why were we involved with Macmillan during this um, during this project? And it was a very exciting uh, process. Uh, and you know, I say congratulations to Humor uh, for winning it. Um, but if you think about it, actually Macmillan have amazing resources on their website. And therein lies the problem that patients have to exit their own pathway to go to a different solution to find information. Whereas actually what we should be doing as healthcare providers is actually using these brilliant resources we have to tailor it and consumerise that information as we've done for a lot of our pathways uh, using best practice, so using Macmillan's best practice. And we talk about pre-health uh, questionnaires. We do this routinely for hundreds of thousands of patients each year. And actually we can tailor each questionnaire to each procedure, to each surgeon, to each cancer, to each oncologist. Um, and you can 
very quickly deliver information and deliver that into EMR systems as we have complete interoperability with all EMR systems. We can be really smart about how we deliver UCON support uh, around uh, virtual uh, reporting back into the service. Uh, and this is not just from a patient point of view, but from an organisation point of view. It means that when you're in a community and you have uh, some of the problems uh, that um, uh, Jacqueline was describing, uh, you can self report them into a service. And obviously, resourcing those services is difficult for us as, as NHS clinicians. But actually, there are inventive ways in which you can then reorganise your services at a regional level or local level uh, going forward by using digital technology. And we already give tailored messaging by patient cohorts uh, throughout our, our practice, but we can extend that out uh, by using Macmillan information. Um, we don't want to develop new information. Macmillan is the gold standard uh, and we should be using it uh, throughout the UK uh, by providing patients with safe sources of advice. We integrate into lots of wearables uh, and we don't really want to reinvent the wheel. You've had lots of companies talk about uh, well, wearables um, and we can integrate into um, your blood pressure, um, uh, O2 saturations uh, and things like NutriCheck, for example, if organisations want that. Our recovery virtual war platform enables us to do all of that. But more importantly, we can link the cancer to specific recovery platforms to the actual wearables that the patients need. Uh, and we routinely do patient initiated follow up uh, and this has been hugely successful in the wider um, uh, pathway design. We do a lot of work around health inequalities, health inequalities, we're very passionate about this. As a National Innovation Fellow, we had to prove we could do this um, and using social terms of health and health inequalities, we're doing a big study at the moment actually at Sherwood Forest in Oscombe around the impact of digital on different population groups. But it must be said, I think one of the um, audience was talking about the inner London uh, experience uh, where deployed in the Homerton, uh, which is probably one of the, the most impoverished per, uh, areas of London uh, with the biggest um, uh, ethnic population uh, per London hospital. I just want to touch on one other really important thing for uh, the future of cancer care. By using pathway uh, devices, which include virtual wards, what enables us to do is now get unique structured data uh, as opposed to unstructured data. And people like me will always glaze over when people start talking to us about AI machine learning. It's, it's sort of very difficult for clinicians to get their heads around often. What I want as a clinician is actually to have that data meaningful for me that makes a difference to my patients. And that's what we're getting now. Because we have pre-intervention data for the patient and post-intervention data, we can start linking factors to patients. And we're leading the way in this. So we can start linking factors about the patient to outcomes of their surgery. And this is a dynamic field, and we're the first to do these in terms of the data we have uh, and how we link into surgical variables. So we can weight that data um, per patient and services back to the oncologist or the surgeon to say the risk of this patient developing hyperglycemia post-surgery or developing a particular complication post-surgery is particularly higher or lower depending on the other comorbidities they have. This is well recognised, but actually now we're able to surface this fairly significantly, fairly early going forward. And we're also able to look at the other part of the jigsaw puzzle within that field, which is actually how do different surgical interventions affect the outcome of the patient? Because clearly what we're trying to do is improve the outcome of patients. And we can start linking their pre-surgical data to the surgical data and in fact, the post-surgical data, whether it be SCAT, radiotherapy, no therapy, whatever it is it happens to be, and actually redefine now how we develop quality metrics for patients afterwards in a live environment. So not a theoretical research environment, but a live environment. And clearly this is what's going to change outcomes for cancer patients, uh, both surgical and non-surgical, uh, going forward. So thank you for the opportunity to present. Thank you for inviting us to the actual original uh, innovation challenge uh, and uh, happy to take any questions. Thanks Sandeep, that was that was great and back to Emma's initial statement I can see why it was so difficult to choose a winner out of all of you. Um, I think there is a question, somebody's got a hand up, Katie. Hi, um, hands up, I have to admit that my research area is machine learning and looking at outcomes and things like that so I'll be a bit geeky around this one. Um, so with um, so it's it's obviously great that you're looking at structuring this data that you're collecting along the pathway because one of my project areas is using NLP to sort of structure and structure data because we see probably about eighty percent of our medical record is unstructured. Um, I'm just wondering, obviously it's great you're going into the surgical area, and um, what how are you populating this information? Because obviously if it gives you the picture, you have to extract decent data from your um, e EPRs into that. 
So remember, uh, oh, sorry, uh, not remember, I apologize. Start, start answer again, apologies, Katie. Um, if you allow patients to talk, they will give you all the answers. Listen to patients. So the, the very thing principle we start, we started with was actually patients are delivering this information from the comfort of their own home. They're delivering effectively structured data to you by very smart questionnaires, which are validated by the teams. Yes, it gets inputted into the EMR straight away, so in the Epic, etc. Um, but actually, it also gets delivered directly into our database. That can then get linked to their post-surgical virtual ward data because actually they are self-delivering that data. So whether they have a neutropenic episode, whether they have a surgical site infection, whether they have pain scores, whatever that data is, it's structured, it gets delivered in. And therefore, you can start linking those, those two key variables together, together with any outcome scores you have to collect, quality metric scores, because they're all patient-delivered. You don't need to wait to get to the EMR, but they're all actually all delivered to the EMR systems. The surgical interoperative data is delivered by the hospital. So, you know, for example, if you're doing a da Vinci prostatectomy, you can just discuss the margins of prostate resection or, or, or whatever you're doing, or, or actually the biopsy results. And you can deliver data into the platform and you can pull the data out of the EMR. And then obviously we're machine learning. Uh, through that entire pathway. And we were lucky that we were one of the five precision medicine grants the UK government awarded last year because they were so impressed with our data. So we're doing a lot of work around that. One of the things that we want to do uh, is actually engage with uh, cancer teams. We have lots of cancer data on our uh, data platform uh, around how do we do this prospectively in a wider NHS environment. Uh, bear in mind, we're deploying lots of solutions already uh, going forward. Yeah. And so really interesting. So I was just wondering what's your sort of consent model, because obviously you're linking a lot of data into doing all the machine learning onwards. Um, so that'd be interesting. And then just actually is a bit of a point. So um, the stuff around the sort of surgical outcomes and who doesn't and do well, um, I really suggest you talk to GERF because I did a machine learning project with them like two years ago where we were looking at not cancer, but other surgical, but obviously it's using all of England, but routinely collected. I think they'd be very interested in your data because obviously you're, and there was, because you can collect data that's not in a sort of national data set. So it'd be a very different insight. So I would really recommend talking to the GERF team because we did that sort of same approach with the um, things about and using that machine learning to actually help with some of the pathway development at GERF as well around this. So I'd really recommend you talk to them. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, it's great advice. Um, but yeah, um, so we have lots of data around that. And obviously we're pushing to, because we're already deployed in hospitals and it's not going to cost hospitals any more money. Uh, yeah, for example, you know, um, you know, uh, Whittington, Royal Free, you know, et cetera. Um, so Whittington, um, Royal Surrey, uh, um, Homerton. Uh, it's developing it into the non-surgical cancer pathways uh, with that input early that um, uh, is where we're going. Thanks, Katie. Um, there's a question in the chat. What are the response rates for the questionnaires? I presume they're asking you, Sandeep, and they don't mean my questionnaires that are in the chat. <laughs> yeah, very high. So, um, you yeah, pre pre-intervention questionnaires, um, over 97% uh, reply within uh, 24, 40 hours. So automated reminders that go out uh, within the integrated process. Um, and um, yeah, uh, it, it's very high. Um, That's great, thank you. Um, any more questions? I think I've gone through the chat. Apologies if I've missed any. Um, just a reminder to put any details into these links that we've given you if you want to connect with our innovators today. Um, thank you to all the innovators. Um, yeah, that's some fabulous technologies coming through there. It really feels like there's a step change in, in this type of care, doesn't it? And really key that you're all listening to the patient voice um, you know, and, and delivering these things around what patient wants. Um, I'm going to hand back to Emma now, who's going to talk about um, where we go next, what Macmillan's going to do in the future. Thanks, Emma. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, echo, Vanessa, thank you very much for the innovators who pitched today. The quality of the pitches were really high. Um, so really appreciate your time coming back a second time to uh, provide an overview of your innovations. So we had, Macmillan had a plan to deliver a second innovation challenge this year, but due to uh, current transformation program, Macmillan and an open strategy process, we've had to push the next challenge back to next year. 
our new organisational strategy is due to, to launch officially, and there'll be some comms around this in Q1 next year, um, but the strategy has impacted slightly the scope of our innovation work at Macmillan. So up until now, we had three innovation priority areas, and they've been earlier diagnosis, treatment transformation, which includes treatment uh, adherence and virtual care and innovations uh, within that space, and then also reducing cancer care inequalities, which has always been a kind of cross-cutting territory. So whenever we're looking at innovations that sit within earlier diagnosis or treatment transformation, we'll always apply the cancer care inequalities lens. Um, so in line with our new organisational strategy, it's been agreed that, uh, I guess, from immediate effect, we'll no longer actively seek or invest in innovations within the earlier diagnosis space beyond our current pipeline and beyond what we've already committed to financially. Um, instead, we'll pivot to focus on diagnostics, so faster diagnosis to support our organisational, uh, new organisational objective around variation in treatment and cancer care. So looking at more uh, faster, more accurate, more precise diagnostics, which will in turn enable better treatment and outcomes, of course. Um, and then our, our existing territories around treatment transformation and inducing cancer inequalities remains in scope so they've not changed um, and the reason why we, we've done this and the reason why the, the the board and our trustees felt we needed to pivot is that there's already a lot of investment and a lot of activity within the early diagnosis space and we felt our efforts would be best placed looking at faster diagnosis uh, to support people living with cancer. Um, so with that in mind we are in some early conversations with life science a life sciences hub Wales, um, looking to co-deliver a joint innovation challenge next year. That um, will have a, a focus on diagnostics, faster diagnosis, but also look at workforce efficiencies. The, the focus is yet to be confirmed and de defined, uh, but if you are interested in hearing more, please do reach out to my colleague Annie Dahl, who's on this call today. Annie is leading that work and she'd be more than happy to provide you with some more information on that. Um, but we've had such a great experience collaborating with the HINs on this innovation challenge that I think that's very much going to be our approach going forward, partnering with HINs or Cancer Alliances or the equivalents in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, so we, if you are interested in potentially running an innovation challenge with Macmillan going forward, please do reach out. We'd be uh, really interested to explore further. I just wanted to, again, say a big thank you to the HINs for their support in this uh, and the innovators. The quality of your pitches and your applications uh, were really high. Thank you for coming back today uh, for sharing an overview of your innovations. And of course, the biggest thank you again for the people with lived experience like Jacqueline that supported our decision making process um, today. So a big thank you. Uh, and that, that's it from me. Handing back over to Vanessa. I think we might have lost Vanessa. She's Hello. Just, I'm, actually, I'm yeah, back. I thought it might, you might have quickly popped into loop break. Sorry, that was a shorter update no, I, from me I than you expected. everybody else managed to stay in the room because my team's just closed down for no reason. I just madly <laughs> messaged Richard and said, can you take over? Apologies, I've just missed the last couple of minutes, but I hope everybody um, uh, didn't disconnect like I did. Um, I'm sure it won't affect the, the recording. So um, uh, does it just remain for me to close? <laughs> It does, Vanessa, yes. And we're, we're giving people some time back in their diaries today, which I'm sure they'll appreciate. Yeah, that's great. Thank, thanks, Emma. And thanks, everybody, um, for joining today. Uh, and most importantly, Jacqueline, um, you know, can't thank you enough for, for bringing some perspective and, you know, pushing us to do better, to be to be quite honest. So thank you to you. Thank you to everybody that's given up um, their time today and congratulations to the innovators. Um, and, and we'll see you in the, the next competition, I'm sure. Thanks again. And we'll give you some time back. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.